Hi everyone. If we have not yet met, my name is Amy Hughley and I am the Associate Artistic Director of the Indianapolis Children's Choir where I primarily work with our high school division ensembles. Um, and I wanted to talk with you and present some ideas uh, about how we teach our secondary choir rehearsals online. For those of us that are teaching high school and middle school ensembles, it has been such a steep learning curve for these past several months. As we all know, we've had to teach ourselves uh, a lot of technological ideas and platforms. Um, we've had to relearn how to communicate with our singers and our families and really each other. Um, and so we know it's been tough. Uh, so a lot of you have learned and done fabulous things already. I'm just gonna share a few of the ideas that have worked for me and for my colleagues um, in rehearsal and what we've done with our high school division. So, um, so really I wanna talk first and I'll share some resources with you and kind of take you through a sample rehearsal of teaching a piece and breaking it down. Um, but first and foremost, we need to remember that this is about community. Choir rehearsals are always about community, as we know, because many times in the past, of course, and most likely in the future, we will need to be on screens again. Community has to be at the forefront. We have to center ourselves on building the relationships, keeping the relationships and maintaining that connection through a strong community, just as much as we are about being fabulous music educators and continuing to educate our children with fantastic literature, how to read music, ear training, all of those things. So that's really kind of a mantra that we need to remember as we do this and as we give ourselves grace and patience. Uh, so before your very first rehearsal begins, the thing, singers are gonna need access to things online, right? So they are going to need PDFs of their music with all of the markings. I can't stress this enough. It's so different, of course, when you're on a screen and we should not be taking the extra time needed to give them breath markings, to give them dynamics, to give them translations, because we want to center the rehearsal as much as possible on the meat and potatoes, learning that music, fine tuning that music when we can, building that community. So um, just something as simple as uh, allowing them to have access to a Google Drive with all of their music in it, even something as simple as just the conductor's copy so that you can see all of the notes about how to pronounce certain things, where the breath marks are, um, flipping the R's, et cetera, you know, separate things like that. So that way when they're in a rehearsal, they can be following along with that per se from time to time on a separate device, or they can print that out in advance um, if they have the capability of doing that. So I, I really found this to be helpful and a time saver. Um, it also saves a lot of time for students that have questions because a lot of our questions are about phrasing and dynamics and understanding text and how to pronounce text um, in some cases. Um, so I did find that really helpful. Um, another thing, let's go back here. Um, another thing to do before you start your very first online rehearsal is try to have um, a place, again, a Google Drive or a Dropbox or some place where they can all have access to this to um, have recordings of a compliment only so that your singers can practice on their own at home. That being said, it is also crucially important to have individual part recordings for every single voice part. And I truly believe that regardless of the advanced abilities of your ensemble, it is important to have those separate tracks because they're not used to practicing so intensely at home or they're not used to not having a rehearsal where they can constantly hear one another at all times, having those individual park recordings, track recordings, which you can either do yourself or I'll show you some resources of where you can find those online, uh, is really gonna be helpful for your singers, especially if you have a closing project such as a virtual choir or a virtual project. Um, also, um, if you can also record uh, yourself or your accompanist playing parts of an acapella piece. Um, but I do highly encourage you to find, if possible, a quality choral performance of a finished quality recording, uh, just to allow them to 
you know, get the full experience of what the particular arrangement and the style of the piece and the tone, all of those things. Um, if you are using Zoom before your rehearsal, the last and final thing I'll say before we start about the, the nitty gritty of, of the order of how we do our online rehearsals, uh, turn off the original sound, which is a setting you can put on Zoom. Um, a lot of times our online platforms think that music is background noise right? So you're going to hear it jumbled, you'll hear it glitching, um, because it's the computer's way of trying to drown it out so that it can hear speaking or so that the participants can hear speaking. So there's a website that I'll include here, which is from the Royal Academy of Music in Denmark, fun little video, uh, very quick, um, that's very that, that's very simple in showing you how to turn off your original sound to get a better sound quality if you're using a platform like Zoom. So I've kind of broken this, well, my head's kind of in the way, isn't it? But I've kind of broken this into six different areas for each virtual rehearsal. And each area is very important, and I'll, I'll break each one down um, uh, as we go forward in this presentation. But take time to welcome every student if possible, or find a way to welcome smaller groups of students if you have a large ensemble. Warm-ups are still really important then make sure you have time for them to listen to something and time for them to sing on mute to something unless you have a platform that doesn't have lag, which is hopefully coming out for us soon. Always give them time to ask questions and then you need to make certain in all of your rehearsals that there is uh, time aside for community building, for connection, not just giving announcements and important things so that they can hear um, important information, but also ways to build community together, which we'll talk about some ideas as to how to do that. So you're welcome. Uh, in general, as much as humanly possible, try to find ways to welcome each of your singers. If you can utilize sectionals or smaller groups, um, it's a great way to do that. Um, one thing that we have had fun with um, in the smaller groups, rather than a group of 50 to 100, um, but in those smaller groups, uh, we've welcomed folks by doing um, a fun activity called highs and lows. Uh, so we all come together and uh, I start off by, by welcoming everybody and individuals as much as possible and talking about maybe a high point of my week and a low point of my week. Um, instead of making people feel as though they're put on the spot, just ask for any volunteers that want to use the chat or raise their hands um, and share maybe something positive that happened in their life or maybe something not so positive that they're struggling with that they feel comfortable sharing with the group. So just some some welcome ideas. That's important. Of course, it is in a normal rehearsal, but so many times when we're in three dimensional worlds, uh, we can start with warm ups right away to gain our attention. In the digital world, as we know, it's not quite that easy. Uh, so start with a welcome. Next, we also want to, um, I think I really feel, and uh, my dear colleague, Mary Evers, she and I, who uh, we co-direct the Indianapolis Children's Choir's Master Chorale High School Division of about a hundred uh, singers. Um, and we both felt when we would, uh, we would share rehearsals for them, um, that warmups were still really important. There's not gonna be as much singing going on maybe proper singing or, or uh, you know, singing that's good for them all the time other than singing with the radio in their homes, unless we give them an opportunity to really practice warming up the voice and knowing how to practice the repertoire without us. So warmups are still important. And I still feel that, you know, warmups should engage their full bodies with posture exercises, with breathing exercises, with um, ideas of as to how to phonate um, in different, with flexibility and range extension, all those things listening, giving them a chance to listen rather than, of course, singing all the time. Listening is so much more important. It always, I shouldn't, I shouldn't minimize the importance of listening in a choral rehearsal ever. Uh, but now that we are online, a lot of times, having a chance to really fully listen and hear, um, since we cannot allow them to sing all together, is really, really important. So we'll talk about ways, ways to do that, but just simple recordings. Um, utilize your student leaders when you can. Vocal modeling when you can is the best gift that you can give them is for them to listen to you sing or listen to a student leader sing and model parts. Listen to fabulous recordings together. Um, listen to accompaniments. Those kinds of activities you can do together. And your training, of course, can really, really help bring you all in the right direction in terms of learning your repertoire. Of course, we all need a chance to sing together on mute 
right? We need to give opportunities for rote singing and for sight reading to continue to build music literacy. And there's ways you can work, work of course, incorporate this in the repertoire that you're teaching. You can incorporate right, rote and literacy exercises as you learn the repertoire. Always, always, and throughout, give time for questions. And I find that doing it uh, using chat especially with larger groups is the most effective and fastest way to do it. Um, I think most of us have, have probably figured that out. Um, in smaller groups, they can unmute themselves and ask questions and that often works too. Uh, but I think we've all found that as we're on, in these online rehearsals, there are going to be a lot more questions just because we cannot be there with them or they're not next to certain stronger singers perhaps that can help them along. And then lastly, probably most importantly, are ways to build that community, not just information and awareness of what is going on, because announcements are more than ever important right now for them. So they know um, what you're thinking, what your organization is thinking, um, and also um, for, for them to just connect, opportunities to connect with one another, to laugh, right? So what I thought I would do is do a, a rehearsal breakdown. Um, and I'll show you different uh, resources. We'll kind of toggle, toggle back and forth between this particular PowerPoint presentation and some of the other um, PDFs and online recordings that I have for you um, so that you can get a feel of maybe what this first rehearsal would be like, for example. Now, in most cases, you're going to probably try, even though your online rehearsals are probably not, maybe not as long as a typical in-person rehearsal would be. Um, if they are, you're very lucky. Um, so in most cases, you would try to introduce or rehearse a number of different pieces. For the sake of our time today, we're only using one piece and teaching one particular piece as an example of the way to teach it. Um, so rehearsal number one, we start with our welcome. We do some highs and lows. We kind of do a scan as people are coming in um, and make people feel as though they're in that safe place. They're back home again. They're with one another. Um, allow them to just feel as though here we are, we're part of this community, you're here today. It's important that you specifically are here to make a difference. And then as soon as we start with the warm ups, I really like to use, again, my head's in the way at the bottom for the final one, but you'll see all of these in my uh, lecture notes uh, later if you'd like to download those. Um, we always, with our warm ups, especially because, you know, we notice that um, if, you're, if the students are sharing or, or if the students have their video um, enabled, then sometimes they're just laying back on their beds and singing, which is often really difficult, of course, um, for them to engage proper breathing, as we know. So getting them to actually, you know, stand up or sit up um, in a singer's posture and do some stretching activities and some posture activities and some shoulder rolls, right? Um, just to get them mindful of their postures. Um, they're, even though a lot of them in, in the cases of online schooling, in the cases of having to go completely virtual, um, it's a different type of stress, right? Um, so we still need to address the fact that the body has to be centered and the body has to be engaged mentally and physically. So posture is important. And then of course, engaging the breath is still important on these Zoom rehearsals. We can do simple things like consonant repeats. Right, all those things with our hands around our middle. We can do certain things like panting like a dog, just simple, silly things like that to engage the diaphragm and to breathe in and hiss. To get our supported breaths going. We also want to do our simple um, exercises with resonance building through our mid range. And our flexibility exercises, right? Or zing a mama, zing a mama, zing a mama, zing a mama, zing, 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 zing. So resonance building, flexibility, and then of course we always still want to engage the range extension. So, 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 engaging the body, going up and up and up to engage the resonance. So whatever warm up, what warm up ideas you have, of course, you do it all the time. So you know what works for your choirs. Um, this is just an order of warm ups that I like to use. And I still think it's important virtually to allow them to feel as quote unquote normal as possible and also really warm their instruments up. So those are the first two steps of rehearsal number one, their welcome and their warm ups. Listening. So 
the piece I'm about to share with you is a piece that's uh, quite relevant um, in our world today and is a social justice awareness piece that we're there, that we're, we're all aware of. Um, make a connection. It's still important for them to know why they're singing what they're singing, to know the history behind it, right? To understand um, why they are the ones who are delivering this message, whatever that message may be, to talk about the translation, to talk about the background, whatever it be, do make that connection as you would in an in-person rehearsal. And then in terms of listening, I, I really think it's important to start with a quality recording that inspires them. It does not necessarily have to be the same exact arrangement of what they are singing, but it should be a quality recording with fabulous voices or as fabulous as you could find, right? That gives them an inspiration for the end product. If you can find a recording of the exact arrangement they are doing, that's fabulous. Or you can, or if you um, can play um, the parts, even if you cannot find a recording, to give them an idea of the end um, with all of the parts together, um, that would be fabulous too. Um, but if you can find that quality recording, even if it's not the same arrangement, it will help. So let's try this. Here we go. So we're going to listen to this fabulous recording of uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And this is the Roland Carter arrangement. You might have seen this floating around on YouTube with all of these fantastic opera singers. It is not the J. Rosamond Johnson uh, SATB version that um, they're going to be learning, but it's certainly inspiring in the basses and the, the men's section has a fabulous tone. So we can share our screen. So allow them to hear something that's going to inspire them, right? Something that's that's just a, a fantastic sound. And then after that, if you haven't played the exact arrangement or if you haven't done a screen share where they can see a score, um, then you take that step. So what I'm using here is a PDF um, of the arrangement that they're going to be singing um, and or of the hymn, actually. Um, and and um, I have a document reader. Uh, so that I can make markings. I'm just using um, Kami, which is, has been really helpful for, for me. Um, so then, of course, you would just play their individual parts, slow it down, and then allow them to hear as you show them the score. sound, then it will help with the glitching, hopefully. Um, and in a perfect world, hopefully the internet connection is, is fantastic as well. Um, so then you would play that through for them so that they can see and hear the finished product. Okay, so let's uh, go on back to the presentation. So um, the next section that we want to uh, look at um, is we want them to be able to sing. Of course, we want them to be able to sing on mute. Um, and then uh, in a perfect world, uh, there are hopefully platforms coming out very soon where the lag time is minimal so that we can sing together as an ensemble. And that would be such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, but giving them an opportunity to sing. And we, as I mentioned before, we need opportunities for both rote singing so that they're, we're working on the ear training and they're hearing things repeated to them as often as possible and for literacy sight reading training, all of those things, we still need to be mindful of that as music educators. So uh, let's talk about how we're gonna do that. Um, rote learning. So let's look at the PDF again. 
And with this document reader, I, I, I love it because then you can show them exactly where you are when you're sharing your screen. We are going to start with rote learning with a unison section. And that unison section, folks, is right here, right? All the way from here to where we end with this four part cadence. OK, so there's our unison section. So we would either listen to the teacher or a student leader singing that part and modeling it, right? <laughs> So I would sing, or a student leader would sing, Sing a song full of the faith that the darkest has taught us. Sing a song, etc., etc., all the way till we get to the end. Song full of the hope that the present has brought. Just that much. So we sing that for them a time or two, and then they're on mute, and they sing it back. Now, for that ending cadence, of course, we're going to allow them to go ahead and try it. Once they hear that a couple of times, right? Just give them as many opportunities to listen and try, listen and try before isolation, right? Before we start to isolate like those parts. So giving an opportunity for rote singing is really important. They're there to listen. They're there to have to make sure that they're continuing to be fed. Um, so let's also talk about how we're going to work in literacy. So for literacy, let's look at the beginning of this. So you might have to mention, since we're starting on a pickup here, um, you might have to mention that we're actually in 6-8 meter, or at least tell them that uh, we've got 6 eighth notes to a bar, etc., etc. right? And this is your chance to, if you want to create a, sec a separate sight reading document that isolates just the rhythm, this is your chance to do that here when you're starting to introduce some literacy concepts. Um, I am going to assume at the moment, since we're in completely homophonic texture and that every single part at this moment has the same exact rhythm, I'm going to uh, assume that the high school ensemble that I am working with or the middle school ensemble that I'm working with, if it's a slightly different higher arrangement, is able to read this rhythm off the page, right? So what I would do is a similar to an in-class, um, a little different, but similar to an in-class sight reading um, exercise, we would work on the rhythm. I would give them a practice tempo with subdivisions. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I would tell them to study on their own with that tempo in mind from here finding their part, rhythm only, over to here. I would give them their tempo again. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I would give them a minute or so, or maybe 30 seconds to 45 seconds to just practice on their own, of course, on mute, on T's and ta's or whatever rhythmic syllables that you use that your students are comfortable with. So we give them a minute to practice their part. And this is where you need to be comfortable with that silence because they're all working and you really can't hear what they're doing. And then we say, okay, keep on mute, everyone. I am going to go ahead and say the rhythm as well. So you have someone to listen to as you perform your rhythm. Let's sight read it. One, two, three, four, five, six, one. Ready, go. T, 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 ta, 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 T, 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 ta. And with your cursor, you can follow along. You can give them a couple of tries to try that, or you can immediately go back and say, I feel like there weren't any questions. If there weren't any questions or no one was confused, let's go ahead and add the text now and we will speak that text on rhythm. Give them just a minute to look over that text and remind them of the tempo. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we try it again. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven. There you go. So there's some literacy, right? Of the rhythm only. All right. Pitch. Ideas for literacy with pitch when you're in online rehearsal. I mean, this is quite similar to something that we would do in person, right? But just now you're giving, they're just stepping it 
back just a bit because we can't really be here in a 3D rehearsal together. So we should choose something to set read all together at the same time. For example, the soprano line. You can have them do their solfege if that is where you're most comfortable doing. Or you can have them do in a neutral syllable, right? But again, setting that steady tempo for them first, allowing them time to practice after you give them their initial couple of pitches. So that way we can go ahead and set the tempo and the tonality, right? And then allowing them to try that with you or with the student leader. Allowing them to try the soprano line and then everybody start reading the alto line. Same, same thing, setting the tempo, giving the opening pitch, making certain that they know what the tonality is and giving them time to practice on the method of your choice, whether it be solfege or whether it be neutral syllables. Same thing for the tenors, same thing for the basses. One thing I forgot to mention in rote learning is if you're deciding to teach this, this particular section by rote, um, you can actually stack it, right? So we can stack it sort of like a, a, a really great uh, way to learn way to learn chords just simply by hearing them. We can try sopranos only, lift every voice, altos only, lift every voice, combine those two. Great, tenors only, lift every voice. Look, it's unison with the soprano, we stack it. So rote learning that way, you can also just start to stack chords to really help. And that's another way that I, method that I would use to teach the ending cadence here. After they come out of that unison section, I would stack those chords by rote. Um, so just some ideas as to ways to incorporate both rote and music literacy as they're being introduced in rehearsal one in an online rehearsal. And then of course you will always want to give them a chance to put them all together. So we say bass, tenor, alto, soprano, and we give it a shot. If you see totally confused faces, places, uh, faces, sorry, then of course you start to isolate or you combine two voices at a time, have the sopranos and altos sing, etc., etc. But really this first rehearsal should just be a chance for them to try it. It's not going to be perfect. And you can remind them that just as if you were all together uh, in a room, this is, it's, it's the same sort of situation. Um, you don't expect perfection the very first time that they learn a piece. So if they're confused or they're frustrated, they can ask questions and you know that you're going to give them tools and videos to use after that first rehearsal so that they can get better and they can know how to practice it on their own um, and improve for the next rehearsal. Um, I would also, um, if there's time, uh, if there's time with this before moving on to a new piece, I would allow them to sight read the end, um, only because if they've learned the beginning and you've given them a decent introduction to the either through part learning or by rote or a combination, if you've given them a decent introduction to that, then you can have them sight read it and say we're starting here and we're going all the way to the end. Here are your parts. Three, four, five, six, here we go. Allow them to try that a couple of times and then you can have a discussion in the chat or if you have a small enough group that they can unmute themselves to respond, you can talk about the similarities and differences just to help them learn it uh, more adequately and understand the structure of the piece. So um, those are ideas for, for singing. Again, you would, you would probably move on to a different piece after you felt as though you were finished and they have given, they have done enough um, for this first rehearsal and you can move on to something else. But make sure that after each piece, you really, in between little sections that you introduce and after every piece, you make a, a really conscientious uh, effort to give them time to ask questions. Um, and as I mentioned before, you're gonna have more questions on these online rehearsals um, because, because of so many factors. So, um, you're also going to find that a lot of times they really are have to be more engaged in some ways than they are in uh, in rehearsals when they're there with you, um, because this is such a, a mental experience when they're on a flat screen in two dimensional 
the two dimensional world, right? So continue to engage their bodies, remind them about postures, have them do activities to keep active um, so that that way it's not just brain work and their entire body is, is being activated here as singers. Um, so let's go back here. So we've talked about the sing aspect of it. We've talked about the importance of asking questions, rote learning and literacy. Now I wanna talk about the importance of building community. So you have finished all of that you've wanted to introduce with new pieces in your first rehearsal. You now have made sure that you have allotted time at the end of your rehearsal to build that community because this, I mean, they, they don't have snack time. They don't have breaks in between classes. They don't have that community time that they would in person, right? So we have to create it in our choir. We have to create that for them. One thing that um, we like to do in our high school ensembles is we, of course, uh, this is a lot of fun. At the end of every rehearsal, we have um, a student volunteer. Typically, it's been like a senior leader um, who is taking as keeping track of birthdays and anybody that has had a birthday in the past week or in the past since the since your last rehearsal whenever that has been um so we find out who that is and then we play it and the fun thing for a happy birthday is that we all take ourselves off of mute and we sing happy birthday and it sounds absolutely horrible but it's so much fun and it's just a little bit of a funny way to shout out to those um, who are having a birthday that we care about them another thing that we like to do which is uh, great for building community and keeping us informed of one uh, of what uh, what's going on in everyone's else everyone's life is we still do something that we used to do in person we would have students write on the board as they entered their rehearsal but they write in the chat instead um, and at the end of the rehearsal, you read the chat to see if there is something they would like to share. Now, you typically want to do something right prior to this so that you're not having to read your entire chat throughout the rehearsal to get information as, as to what you would share with the brag board. But if someone had any information that they wanted to share, maybe they were accepted to college, maybe they got their driver's license, maybe they scored an A on the test, maybe they went out on a first date, whatever that is that they want to share with their choir community, perhaps when you're singing happy birthdays or when you're doing another community building activity, you invite them and say, now is the time that you can write in the chat anything you want to share for our brag board our virtual brag board. Um, and then we just have an opportunity to share that. And the director will just say, here's what's going on. Congratulations to Andrea. You just got your driver's license. Congratulations. You just passed this class, whatever it is. There are virtual ways to do this, of course, on other platforms. Um, and you could have them go to a Google slide and write it in that way. Um, but it depends on the time that you want to put into this and just give them an opportunity to share in any way that you can. Um, we also like to do scavenger hunts, scavenger hunts if they're comfortable with this. Now we understand there's the issue of privacy and not every student wants to share uh, what the inside of their home looks like, which is certainly something that we all respect. Um, scavenger hunts are, are just as much fun to watch, therefore, as they are to be a part of. Um, so what we usually do for a scavenger hunt is we give everyone a certain amount of time to find a certain object in their house. It could be their favorite food that's in the freezer, or it could be go and find a pet or your pet that you live with and bring it back to the screen and show us what it is. And we can make it really competitive and say, and whoever is the first person to write the name of the object that they found in the chat wins a point for Team Soprano or wins a point for Team Alto. So it does get competitive, it does get really fun. Um, and it's a way for us to all just laugh and relax and have the kind of fun that we probably wouldn't be able to do in person uh, because everyone's gonna come back from their homes, different parts of their homes with different ideas of what their scavenger hunt item is. Um, Zoom games, there are so many Zoom games um, that are online and I have put a website in here of 20 great little Zoom games that you can use that will be in the lecture notes as well. Um, it's also um, a chance during this building the community time um, for you to address technology issues, to maybe screen share so that you can show them, here's where you find your practice tools. Here's how you can use your practice tools. Um, because for some of them, it's gonna be a steeper learning curve than others in terms of how to use 
the resource technology that we have. And then um, I also wanted to make sure I gave a shout out to ACDA, which is what is written right there, their COVID response committee report, um, which came out quite recently. Um, in the appendix, there are lots of fantastic educational ideas and resources for online learning as well. Um, so check that out. After your rehearsal, if you are, whether you're in a hybrid situation where part of your time is online, part of your time is in person, or if you're completely online, it's really important to reinforce with videos that they can watch. As we know, all of our students are, have different learning styles. So for them to have the opportunity to see a video that you have created, just a 10, 15 minute video that reinforces what you have already taught in the Zoom session, or in your WebEx session, in your virtual rehearsal, they can stop, they can start, they can repeat. It is a great way. And that's different, of course, from just sharing a recording of the video um, of your rehearsal. Um, to, to do a very condensed, no longer than 10 minutes, 15 minutes video where that specifically focuses on the concepts that you have reinforced, that you have introduced um, or covered in a rehearsal is so helpful for them. You can also do videos with practice tips. I mean, our, our students have know how to practice at home to some degree, um, but not necessarily with an amount of discipline or with any sort of structure. So giving them practice tips is really hel uh, helpful. You could also do a rehearsal video with the technology how-to as well. Make a video of how they can navigate online or in your Google Drive or Dropbox to use the practice tools that you have given them. Or you can even use it, use the, the post rehearsal video to finish the last thing you've done and introduce a new section so that they're ready and feel ready for the next rehearsal. I like to use uh, Kami, which I've, I'm already using here as a document reader. There's lots of document readers out there so that you can mark up a PDF as you're in the middle of the video. I also like to use uh, Loom or BombBomb. I'm using Loom right now to make my rehearsal video, uh, to make my post rehearsal videos. Now rehearsal number two, I will not go into as much depth um, as rehearsal number one, because I think you get the idea, but I'm still using the same structure starting with welcome and welcome activities, starting with a real warm up, doing a listening activity, singing, uh, both in both sectionals and combined choirs, giving them time for questions and allowing them to build community. What I would do if possible for the second rehearsal, if needed, or for the third rehearsal, if needed, but quite helpful, is to actually stagger your rehearsals so that you can have sectionals. So have, for instance, the sopranos and the altos come together first, or just the sopranos. If you have that luxury, just the sopranos come for the first 20, 20 to 25 minutes then just the altos come, then just the tenors, then just the basses, or combine your women and have a women's sectional, combine your men and have a men's sectional. Um, I was very fortunate for Master Chorale to have a co-director, so Mary Evers would work with the men, I would work with the women, and then we would just put it all together. Um, and it worked really well. You can use your breakout sessions for this, or you can have two different Zoom links. Um, if you have two separate rehearsals, to, if you want to start two separate rehearsals and then have one join the other Zoom session at the end or the other WebEx session, uh, whatever is easiest for you and for your choir. And let's see, any other notes about rehearsal number two? Oh, so you still want to have opportunities for them to listen, listening to two parts together. If it's a combined rehearsal with sopranos and altos, say, um, but still give them challenge. Don't just spoon feed them in these in these sectionals, right? So we still want them to be able to hear two parts at a time and listen, and find their lower part if they're an alto or find their upper part if they're a soprano before you isolate each section. And then it's always important to make sure if you can to combine at the end of those sectional rehearsals to give them the full experience of how their particular part is going to matter in the whole grand scheme of things, right? And then of course, continue to build your community at the end after you give them an ample time to ask questions. So um, here are some resources and these resources, most of them I found um, on the ACDA um, COVID-19 committee report response uh, uh, document that, that was published and it's quite helpful. I highly recommend that. Um, but your singers are going to need to practice individually at home as we've already mentioned. And we need to give them tools because we're not allowed to be with them in person in some cases, or we just can't even if we're in a hybrid rehearsal. So uh, my choral coach, 
Uh, you may have heard of this before. It is $50 for six months for directors and free for singers, but essentially, um, and we're not quite sure if uh, after six months, if there's a cost yet, but at least for six months, we know it's $50 for directors, which is a deal. You'd have to upload the music, use a CP, use CPDL um, or uh, use uh, Finale or MuseScore or something that you can, or uh, go through a publishing company that has um, downloaded uh, electronic music that works with it, such as GIA. Um, but this is a practice real life practice tool for your singers. They sing into the in into a mic, the computer program hears their part, the computer program corrects their part, listens for intonation. You can set it on the particular uh, skill level you want to, to, to focus on. So for instance, if they're just learning it, you can set it on the easy level, which means that they're not going to nitpick intonation and they're not going to nitpick um, holding out uh, phrases for as long or notes for as long as you need to. You can also set it on moderate or medium level to, to difficult level so that it's a lot more uh, critical of what the singers are doing. Um, and we'll say, oh, you're under pitch here. Oh, right here, you're a little bit sharp. Oh, right here, this rhythm was not executed exactly correctly. Um, the nice thing is that you can then go back as a director and listen to um, every singer after they've submitted their individual parts. And you can give them comments and you can give them encouraging comments or helpful tips, whatever it is that you need to do. I can't stress the importance of choral tracks. Um, and you can spend $1,000 a year if you have the money, that would be fabulous, to uh, look at Matthew Curtis's choral tracks online. Uh, he is a fantastic vocal model and he uses other vocal models as well. And he would he creates individual parts um, for every section, for every piece that you are doing. So that the choral tracks are there and that the importance of the students having access to their individual parts for individual practice is really important. You can also do this yourself or you can hire someone else to do this if you don't want to spend thousand dollars a year but um, I have, have had many colleagues I myself have not used choral tracks but I've had many colleagues who have used it and enjoyed the quality track recordings that they receive um, there's a few others here um, that you're that you can also look into soundtrap and smart music and Coraline Keras music uh, if, especially if you're if you're doing a master work I highly recommend um, Keras Music is is um, a fantastic resource and the singers do have to purchase individual pieces on the app, um, but it's it's high. It's worth it and the recordings work well. So uh, my, my last slide that I really want to share before I wrap things up and talk about the importance of the patience that we have to have in this whole process um, is that if you choose to do a virtual project or a virtual choir as an end result um, after teaching pieces online or through hybrid rehearsals, whatever it, it is, um, there are a few things that I have learned that I would love to share with all of you. Uh, you may and I would love to hear your thoughts. You may have learned even more things um, as to do's and don'ts of what to do for virtual choirs. Um, and I would love to hear those because we're continuing to help each other through this process. Um, it's really helpful to have a recording of yourself conducting. Our singers are so used, used to the visual. The, the auditory uh, tracks, of course, are, are so helpful too to have recording the, the, uh, record the singing tracks for every voice part so that, so that as they're singing in the virtual choir, they're hearing their exact part in the right tempo. That's important. But a visual conducting video, it, it, it makes all the difference, uh, especially for uh, entrances and cutoffs, right? And especially even for things like dynamics, it just makes it so much more musical. Uh, there's still going to be a little bit of lag, of course, with a virtual choir, and it will not be anything like a live choir, but it can help. I mean, in some cases, of course, utilize your click tracks um, whenever you can. And the last little uh, little two words that I wrote that my head is covering um, is create a realistic deadline for them to give you the tracks that they have created because there are going to be technology issues on your end and there are going to be technology issues on their end. So give yourself and them plenty of room. There are going to be questions. There's going to be heartache. There's going to be frustration. So the more room and the more flexibility that you can give with an initial deadline, the better so that you have room to turn it around and to help them along the way. 
three words I want to end with, three words that we need to remember during this entire pandemic every single day. Patience, patience with our choirs, patience with each other as colleagues, uh, patience with every person that we live with, right? And patience really with ourselves um, as choral directors and as teachers, so many of us are perfectionists. This is hard. This is very hard because we want to do it well and we want to do it right. But of course, it's the first time that we've all en encountered this situation before. So be patient with everyone around you and be patient with yourself. Give yourself and your singers grace. Um, for me, and you may be like me, it's a lot harder for me to find grace and forgiveness for myself than it is for me to forgive and give grace to others. And that is just so crucial right now. We have to be able to take care of ourselves, to give ourselves the time that we need to process, to have boundaries, to heal, and to really think about how our lives have changed and continue to change as we move forward, really for the better in many ways, right? And lastly, I'll end with love, uh, just because sometimes it takes a situation like this to realize how much we love what we do and how much we truly, truly love every singer, every singer that we work with. We may not realize how much of an important part of our lives that we are. And for us to show love in any way that we can on a screen, to really be genuine with them and to be open and to, for them to know that we care about them and that they, they can continue to be in a safe place. Um, even if that safe place is virtual right now is really important. So again, I will have these lecture notes available. Um, they're a lot more detailed than the presentation has been. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. We're really in this together. We can help each other. Um, I am certainly not a technological guru, so I love to hear about what new people have taught themselves, what new people have learned, and what pe new people what what people are already doing with with their choirs. Thank you, and I hope to see you in person soon.